The great spirit is all things. He is in the air we breathe. The great spirit is our father. But the earth is our mother. She nourishes us. That which we put into the ground, she returns to us. Wabanaki, Agonko. Mother Earth that stands before you is an ancient land. The great glacier has long ago scraped the mountains of soil and made them round. Mother Earth gave the people who hunted its forests, fished its streams, and planted its fields sustenance. But the land did not belong to the people, for it was Mother Earth. And Mother Earth cannot be owned. The people were the caretaker, the steward for Mother Earth, seeking harmony for what they needed and what was good for their mother. And the people were called the Nipmunk, the freshwater people. The land before you was the land of the Nipmunk, the caretakers for Mother Earth. Even the river knew who protected it, for it was called the Nipmunk River. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And it's true, the early maps indicate this body of water to be the Nipmunk River. Of course, we know it as the Blackstone River today, and we think it got its name from William Blackstone, who was the first English settler here in 1635. You see, we think that the traders who frequented Roger Williams' trading post in Providence in the late 1640s referred to the river as Mr. Blackstone's River. And of course, we know the story of the native peoples here, the Narragansett, the Wampanoags, the Nimbucks, the Niantics, the Piquas, and all the other native tribes. We know their story, don't we? Of course we do, because the history books tell us that when the English settlers came here, they brought with them epidemics, and there was a vicious, nasty war, and more epidemics, and wiped clean the landscape of the native peoples here. That's what the history books say. Matter of fact, in 1822, the Secretary of War received a report on Indian affairs that stated that the Indian communities in New England were just a few feeble remnants teetering on the brink of extinction. That's what the history books tell us. Well, my friends, I'm going to suggest to you that the history books are wrong. They don't tell us the story of the native peoples here. And it's a much larger story and one we need to know about. And I want you to focus on one concept. He who writes the history controls the history. So join me as we take a hard look at the written history and rediscover the people of the Dipmuk Nation. that song, I was country before country was even cool. Well, I was nipmuc before being nipmuc was cool. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't, definitely was not a cool thing. As the Wampanoag medicine person, Slow Turtle used to express it, we were born to be anthropologists. We study white people all our lives. It's the only way to get along <laughs> in this world. If the Indians won, it was a massacre. The colonists won, it was a battle. And I think that uh, that needs to be to be to be brought out because we know it wasn't that way. You're probably wondering why two rangers in the National Park Service are sitting in the middle of the woods with books. We have to remember, we're readers of history. We're looking for new ideas, new concepts, new ways of understanding. And sometimes sitting out here with Mother Nature is the best way to come to those revelations. Now, I'm with my good friend and ranger colleague, Dan Maharg, and Dan has been doing some research here on the communities in the Blackstone Valley and how they treated or listed the natives, the Native Americans here. And Dan, what have you come up with? Well, I got out of our park library three county histories, or three local histories. This is the history of Worcester County, written in 1879. This is a history of Grafton, also written in the 19th century. And this is a 20th century history, uh, history of Upton. And so I just looked in there for you, Chuck. I looked up Nipmuc people and went, wanted to see what they said. So 
This is uh, Frederick Pierce's book from 1879, A History of Grafton. And in here he says uh, that the Nipmuc people over the last two centuries have vanished. So totally disappeared, according to Frederick Pierce. But I was looking at a census that was done in 1992 that said that living in Worcester County now, there are 1,400 Nipmuc people. So I was a little surprised. Why does it say they vanished here? And yet nowadays we have 1,400. That's even more amazing when you consider the town of Grafton has the Nipmuc Reservation there, the Hasamimisco. Right. And that is a centerpiece of Nipmuc culture. Yeah. and has been for decades, centuries. Right. So why would they say that those people no longer existed? Well, that's a tough question because, like you said, Frederick Pierce obviously knew his neighbors and he knew the people living at the reservation there. And why he decided to not call them Nipmuc people is really interesting. Uh, I think it has something to do with Frederick Pierce and other people's attitude at that time in the 19th century, their attitude about what an Indian was. And for them, what an Indian was was somebody who lived out in the forest, who lived maybe in a little teepee or a wee to someplace, uh, who mainly lived by hunting or making baskets. And as he looked around at his neighbors at Hassanamisco, he saw them as barbers, stone workers, factory workers, shoemakers, and he said, well, these people aren't living the way I think Indians live, so therefore I'm not going to call them Indians. I'm just going to assume that they vanished. And I think that's why in these local histories you don't find descriptions of native people as they're living, um, as shoemakers. They're not being described as native and factory workers. Because that, be, that would go against our, our romanticized view right. of uh, the Indian. Right, they're not living in the forest, so therefore they're not Indian, according to these folks. It must be very difficult for people to overcome that kind of stereotype. The only way you can be an Indian or Indianness would be out in the woods, where how are you going to make a living and fit into society? Right. So for Nipmuc people, this must have been particularly di a difficult time to live because here you have a bunch of people in the dominant culture, the white culture, let's say, saying, you've all vanished. You're no longer Nipmuc people. And you have Nipmuc people saying, well, I consider myself a Nipmuc person. I have a family heritage. I have a set of beliefs. And I have a community that I live with that it, for me, is distinctly Nipmuc. The same time you have the white culture saying, no, you're shoemakers now. And more importantly, you're a person of color. You're no longer a Nipmuc person. And that shows through in these um, county histories and also in the census records at the time. You find a person described in the 1860 census as an Indian. In the 1870 census, they're described as a person of color or a colored person, same person but the census taker, as part of the white dominant society, decides that this person is no longer Nipmuc. There was kind of an ethnic cleansing with a pen going on. <laughs> and it was, if you did not have white skin, you were considered black. And a lot of times, I mean, even today, you go into the town halls and you see where people have actually written over the records mm -hmm. where yeah. it was That's put in that they were Indian and someone went in and wrote black over it. And you can actually see in censuses from time to time where they may have been Indian in the first three censuses and then the last six of their life they're considered black. But you not also notice something else on those censuses that they were together here and they're still together here. It hasn't mattered what people have decided to do you know, how they wanted to do what they wanted to do, we've stuck together. Beneath the myth of disappearance that is in all of these published books from the early 1800s on, beneath that is the fact of the Indian presence. And the very same books that will say the Indians disappeared will then proceed to tell you all about the Indians that they know that are part of their communities. And what is abundantly clear through the secondary sources and through the uh, overseers' records, the Indian overseers' records, is that the Indians never disappear. They're always here. The Nipmuc presence and persistence is, is real, in fact, the reality. Over in, in Grafton, where the Hassanamisco Reservation is, which I should backtrack, there's, after King Philip's War, only two Nipmuc homelands were recognized uh, as a sanctioned settlements, Hassanamisco and Grafton and Chipanagungamug over in Dudley Webster. And the Indians there were assigned overseers 
to, to manage their affairs, which they did very poorly. But the Indians on the reservation very much had relationships with the white people who were their neighbors and, and, and their overseers. And the obvious bond of affection between Cornelia Brigham, the youngest daughter of the overseer over at Hessen and and one of the Indian families on the reservation is the fact that the Indian child gave the white child a doll and some baskets that stayed in the family for generations. There was an obvious bond between the, ch the two children. And of course, both of them knew that Sarah was Indian. because She lives right on the reservation. And these facts are the day-to-day -day realities that they defy that larger narrative, but the larger narrative is what shaped the way the history, the story was told in the history books. The Indians negotiate life around the white people. Now, how they do this is they work as laborers, field hands. Uh, they make baskets. One of the biggest, most visible um, reminders to us that the Indians never, ever disappeared is their baskets. And every museum in New England, you'll, you'll, they, they should have, they probably have Indian baskets. What the Indians always had made baskets, but now they made them for the white marketplace. We love this part of, of the world of New England, Turtle Island, and the knowledge that there were people who would have the power to just pack us all up and send us out west someplace was a, a big danger hanging over our head, a very real danger, and it was a very real possibility. And this is, again, this wonderful example of, well, the Indians are gone, but this is a very personal story of two Indian women in Worcester who um, were laundresses for most of their lives, but they became cake makers and cooks for the um, high society, the, the nouveau rich, the business class, these, these people who are making a lot of money and wanting to make a name for themselves. The old elite don't have to do this, the new ones do. And in the 40s, uh, this has to do with changing culture as well. Events like weddings, which used to be very personal, became very public affairs. She, who has been a laundress all her life, um, becomes a local celebrity for her wedding cakes. And then her daughter does the same thing. These two Indian women, everyone knows they're Indian. They're in very high demand for their services in the community. This is the community where the last Indian's been gone since, you know, forever. This kind of cross of reality and myth. And unfortunately, the myth is what has made it into the history books. And at this time frame, your ceremonies, your language, what happened to them? Basically, in today's terms, it would be called underground. And in large part, I think we probably all agree, it was basically the Narragansetts who helped to preserve that because they had, they did retain a fairly large land base compared to the inland peoples. And they maintained continuity of not only the spiritual ceremonial activities, but uh, they were free to speak the language where if you survived by managing to somehow um, deal with the situation of, of living in the, in the white towns, as they called them, it was against the law to speak the Indian languages. So the only way to maintain uh, contact with your identity was to have these almost like clandestine gatherings where it was okay to be yourself. Even though I would come home from school crushed, Grandma was always there, always there for me. And she, she taught us that it would, you know, that we needed to be proud of our heritage. And she taught us everything that she knew. She helped by telling us stories, by telling us the traditions, what they did. She helped, her sisters were great at gathering herbs. Our cloth medicine, was made every year. My grand aunts would come up on the bus and they had this basket which sits on the mantle of our fireplace. And they had this basket covered with a tea towel and in it they had all the remedies for the winter. Cough medicine, 
rubs, sob, that they had gone out behind their home and gathered the herbs and made all these. So I would ask, well, what's this made of? And I was told how to make this cough medicine. I might add, mine never tasted like this. Mine tastes terrible. I used the same ingredients, but I could never get it to taste like Aunt Ethel's and Aunt Rebecca's cough medicine. So even though I was hurting and really hurting, I knew that it was because of ignorance, because how could anything that was so wonderful be so wrong? And all the kids in the neighborhood used to gather on the bulkhead at our house in Woonsocket and listen, to, because they all listened to my grandmother's stories. All their friends in the neighborhood came over because she, you know, she'd just sit there and tell them stories for hours and hours. A noted historian, Eric Hobsbawm, once wrote, where the old ways are alive, traditions need to be neither invented or revived. And it's well that we consider that statement as we listen to the stories and the language of the Nimbuk people, because there's a richness and vitality and a beauty in the Algonquin language. Okay, Aniquis. And now this is the red guy that's something like a little sly dog. Wanquisis. 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 We'll see how well everyone can follow. If you can do it in unison, that would be wonderful. Good morning. Motapunwani. Oh. Motapunwani. Motapunwani. Tobani kura maramesh. I don't have to do very much work. <laughs> how are you? Tokatanakitiam. Oh, say that again. I can never get that. Tokatanakitiam. <laughs> No, we started off with good morning, now good afternoon. Story of the strawberries. Um, it's about peace. It's about a, a young boy and a young girl, brother and sister, who had a, a very, very serious argument. And they, they walked different ways. And uh, they both felt really, really hurtful inside that they, this had all happened. Um, and uh, they were asking for help, and, and the wise one came to them and, and uh, told the little girl that uh, as her teardrops fell, uh, they turned to bright red speckles uh, on, the, on the ground, and it was the strawberries. And uh, as they fell, she picked them up and put them in, in her... Uh, her dress, and uh, she was told to go to walk as far as she could and, and catch up with her brother and, you know, give them to her brother as a peace offering. And, and the strawberry moon is about peace and regeneration. If you have a, a bad uh, time with someone, you, you offer the strawberries as a peace offering to the person. And you forget your, your, dif you know, your, your differences and you go on from there. One of the other reasons that we have managed to hold it together and keep going forward is because we rely on each other greatly. And yes, we do have disagreements and everything amongst ourselves, but let something come at us and we're all there together, standing up together for it. And I think that's really something that you really do see all through our history is that we do stick together and the nation is strong. From the beginning of time, drums have played a central role in how we communicate. Ceremonial or warlike, regardless how they are used, they strike a deep primordial chord within us. Feel the power of the drum. It took about three months to make it was a vision of the clan mother so that um, we would not be drumless at a powwow. And if you notice the shape, it's almost in the shape of the sea turtle, which also she had visioned. Um, the shell of the drum is made of willow. When we went to the drum maker's house, he happened to just have a big chunk of willow tree that the neighbor had cut down. And we worked that over, uh, I'd say, a month and a half or so taking care of hollowing it out because it tends to split and stuff, so you've got to stay after that so it doesn't come right through. 
the willow tree was important to us. There were many, many medicines from the willow. Uh, we have a moose hide on this side for the spirit of the moose, and we have buffalo on the other side for the spirit of the buffalo. We love her. Uh, we say her because the drum is the female energy, and um, it's the spirit of the spirit of the people, the heartbeat of the people, the earth. I drum for the ancestors to carry on for the children who are coming up. Respect for for both sides. Drum for the people that like to listen today. She's a beautiful, a beautiful instrument that has come to life. We, we believe that she has a life, a spirit in the drum, more than one with everything that I had mentioned that goes into it. It was put together with uh, prayers and, and the uh, sweet grass and sage burnt through every step of the way. Every, every day we worked on it, it was always prayed over. So it's very special. I started out a long time ago. My grandfather used to take me to powwows. Since then, my brother, Thunder Spirit, um, showed a great interest in drumming. And I came to this drum. And as soon as I started drumming on this drum, my life's changed dramatically. I've become a better person. Um, I've met a beautiful woman, it's changed my life. Um, I see a great improvement through my brother. So I'm, I know the ancestors are happy with us drumming. And I started going to powwows and the drum just drew me to it. And uh, it just had me in a trance, I, I guess you could say. For me, is a uh, connection to our mother, to all, all living things, the trees, the grass. Uh, we give thanks for all those things. Uh, the mother hears the vibrations when we, when we play the drum. Uh, when we all beat together in harmony, it represents, for me, the harmony that we need to get with Mother Earth. Uh, we're out of balance right now, and we need to work on getting back in balance and treating the mother right. So when I drum, I pray for the mother and uh, for all living things and, and for all my brother's health and, and all the people's health on the earth. Uh, and then sometimes it's just for fun. It's a matter of heart. It's a matter of spirit. Uh, the drum to us is a religious thing. Uh, the music to us are prayers. Um, we, have a, we have a kinship with Mother Earth. We have a kinship with all the people that sit at this drum and the people that are related to the people that sit at this drum. Um, for me, this is as good as it gets. My spirit really just soars. Sometimes I feel I leave my body when we drum. The brothers keep me in check, but for the most part, when I sit at the drum, I go where spirit takes me. And for me, that's why I do this. Tradition. Our tradition needs to be important to us as a people because Basically, what we had was taken from us, um, and we need to get it back for the harmony of Mother Earth. We need unity amongst all people. And uh, Native American belief is ways to do that. Is to, one of the ways to do that is through the drum. When I first went to a powwow, I was with my brother and my grandfather. 
and I saw the people dancing and having fun. And I thought the drummers are the people that support all, this, all the dancers and brotherhood and unity. And I said, that's what I like to do. So when I got older, I thought I could be one of those people that can help out the people. So that's why I come and drum with all my friends, my brothers. I like it. That's why I come. I was drawn to the drum. Um, I'd been to powwows, I'd been to practice, I was eventually invited. The drum itself has an energy, as some of the brothers have said. I, that energy gives me life. The feedback I get from my brothers and from my drum, it makes me a better person. It also reminds me I'm part of a community. Our ancestors were a community that supported each other and we don't have that in the world. I get that from the drum and I get that from my brothers. And when the, the way the drum touches me, I believe, helps me to be able to give that to others as well. I can't stay away. I'm grateful that the drum called me. There was no point where we were extinct. And to whatever we attribute that error or fallacy to, the important thing is that we ourselves uh, don't let it influence our thinking in any way or be influenced other than to have a stronger determination to hold our nation together and help dispel those myths and fallacies and celebrate our culture as much as possible. And other than that, by being true to what we have been fortunate enough to have been taught by our elders as well as the ancestors that far enough back that they walked the earth before we were born and had the forethought to preserve this heritage for us that's that's what's most important to us to carry that on in the words of our prayer to another seven generations well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And I hope we provoked you today to think a little bit about who writes history and what does that mean. And I also want to take one short step back in time as we close here. I want to go back to 1876, the 200th anniversary of King Philip's Metacomet's death. And the governor of Rhode Island was asked to speak at this anniversary. And to sum up what he said, he basically said that the Native Americans had been wiped clean of the landscape. It was unfortunate, but there wasn't anything anyone could do about it. Well, thankfully, the governor of Rhode Island was wrong. For the Native peoples of the Blackstone Valley have always been with us. They've worked in our mills. they built stone walls. They've sailed the seas. They've made wedding cakes in Worcester. They brought up their families, and they maintained the traditions, their language, and their culture. And it hasn't been easy to overcome the written word of history. But through visionary leaders centuries ago, decades ago, and still with us today, they've managed to keep their traditions alive and well. And for that, we are very thankful. For they make us a better people, a stronger people. And you know, there are never too many caretakers for Mother Earth. Until next time, we'll see you in the Blackstone Valley.